great. Thank this you was us. my. This was. Uh, I've now started the session, and thank you for the heads up. Um, apparently, I had to push a button that I wasn't told to. I've launched it. So, good morning to everyone. I'll just repeat very briefly. I'm Lou Marinoff, uh, professor of philosophy at City College. I have the privilege of uh, moderating this really interesting and I think important panel. We have a very estimable assembly here, and I hope the audience will also be, have time to jump in. Uh, this topic that we're asked to tackle is sustainable development, unlikely collaborators and innovators. The pandemic has forced upon us not only a medical crisis, but uh, one that also has given rise to economic, educational, humanitarian, social, and probably psychological and philosophical problems down the road. So we need to address these issues. In the first round, I will invite each speaker in, in order to please give us their view on the immediate present, how their particular area of expertise is working both to forge unlikely collaborations in light of the pandemic, or indeed to uh, explore new dimensions of existing collaborations. So firstly, it's a great pleasure to introduce Payal Dalal, who's Senior Vice President of the Social Impact Sector of MasterCard, based in London. Uh, so please, Payal, give us your uh, initial views. Four minutes, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Hi, everyone. Really great to be here at Horasis and, and talk about not only sustainable development, but the need to partner. To me, the frame of this conversation and the thematic that's going to run through all of the speakers is that, you know, we can't operate in silos anymore. We have to do it in collaboration um, and in partnership. I think in sustainable development, um, partnerships were always a nice to have, but I think the pandemic has really highlighted that it is a must. It is a necessity now. Um, I'm part of something called the Center for Inclusive Growth, which is the social impact arm and the philanthropic hub of MasterCard, the company. As you can imagine, we're focused on things that ladder up to inclusive growth. So making sure that people are financially secure, that there is a robust future for workers, that we are thinking about place-based economic development, and we're thinking about how to really bridge the capability gap between the, what the public sector is able to do and civil society is able to do and the private sector is able to do when it comes to data for good. The pandemic really reinforced the thematics that we're working on and how important and critical they are. Um, you know, I would say the first the first few months of the pandemic were very much focused on relief. How can we ensure that people have what they need to make it, whether it's hygiene, whether it's food, whether, um, you know, it's it's short term um, relief. I think now that we've seen um, the pandemic wane in some markets, I know that we have second waves in others, um, we're really oriented around recovery. And for us, recovery is very much around the future of small business. And so if I think about the thematic of this conversation, which is collaboration, there we cannot in isolation work to help small businesses recover, survive, and hopefully thrive. And so we're working in collaboration with a number of partners from civil society society to other private sector partners to think about how we bolster these small businesses, whether it's addressing their working capital needs, whether it's helping them think through their migration to digital. As you can imagine, digitization is now key. Um, you know, thinking through how do you help navigate to e-commerce? How do you take online customer service and, and think through your social media marketing? Um, to, to things like cybersecurity, we're, you know, we're seeing now that the move to digital has prompted a lot of nefarious activity. And so, you know, I think this is a long winded way of saying that, you know, we're really committed to COVID recovery. We think small business is really the key, but we have to do it in partnership with others. And I can later on talk about some of the partnerships we have, um, active because I think that will be really illustrative of how we're working with unlikely collaborators and non-traditional partners. Thanks, Lou. Thank you very much, Payal. That was a really great, concise, concise summary. I wish philosophers could be that concise and on point. Uh, you did mention in passing, and maybe we'll have a chance to come back to this. Uh, I just want to underscore this uh, thing about private-private partnerships. We, 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 we know a lot about private-public, but this possibility of private-private is very interesting. And I know there's something on the horizon that would be an actual portal for small businesses to access and get some help that way. So maybe we'll be able to return to this in your second segment. 
Without further ado, I want to move on to our next speaker, who's Florian Kemmerich, managing partner of Bamboo Capital, based in Switzerland. Uh, this has a, a distinctively Asian ring to it, uh, Florian. So perhaps you could enlighten us on your uh, activities vis-a-vis -vis this uh, problem of uh, new collaborations, unlikely collaborations and innovation. All, all yours, Florian. Thank you, Lou, and uh, uh, excited and delighted to be here. So specifically, I mean, we are an impact investing uh, asset manager. We've been doing that since 2007. We invest and we provide private debt and private equity uh, to commercial companies servicing the low-income population, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And again, over the years now, this has devel developed in a very exciting phase now, what I would look at, um, where we in the old days invested capital into a company, you know, was much more risky. Um, we were going more late stage, larger tickets. But how now, again, in order to really uh, drive sustainability and specifically impact investing on the ground, where we do not only thrive for financial returns, but also um, look at what re really happens on the ground, we're measuring that. In terms of, you know, the low income uh, population on, in rural areas where we measure, um, economic, in, economic inclusion, poverty uplift, also electrification of households, access to, um, finances. So different specific aspects within. And of course, most of them are smallholder agri, uh, smallholder farmers anyway. So it's actually also an interest from an even rich country looking at food security. So there are really, really several angles to it. Now we were investing. And uh, larger tickets early on, over 10 years ago, um, for more, let's say, for secure investment. But we had to go riskier earlier in order to really be on the impact investing side, in order to help scaling our businesses to resolve issues. And what has really happened is if you look at uh, right now that, I mean, there's a trend of sustainability because there's a quest for purpose from the demand side, from the investors. But also then you've seen the aid money, which has done a lot of you know, capital provided, especially to Africa, for example, or to the poor areas of the world. Um, not necessarily that, that has led to an infrastructure in terms of creating SMEs. And this is really where our laser focus is. Um, we believe SMEs are the wealth of a nation. And that's where we have to kick in. And you can see that specifically happening in the COVID times right now, where the rich countries are they're bailing out the SMEs with substantial money. Now, COVID has a health and economic effect on Europe, for example, Switzerland, where I sit, but it does not have the humanitarian com component in it in emerging markets where people cannot just stop, confine, stay at home, wait three months, and then come back to hopefully still have a job because they ha life has to go on. So there's a home and humanitarian component. However, the big effect of COVID right now has been really that um, the digitalization has increased. And that is where we have seen actually, even before COVID, that technology resolves the issue of access and affordability of goods and services to the rural population. So actually it provides them real, the first time really uh, to participate in the real economy. So that's a part where I just um, see that different players, non-for-profit money, for-profit money, come into convergence now and understanding that if they double down in impact investing, so that there's really an alignment and something to gain so that we can focus on missing middle and on early stage investment in our companies. So it's exciting time. And it's being accelerated right now, even post COVID by many of the participants in impact investing. All right. Thank you very much, Florian, for your introductory remarks. I was just going to say, and thank you for saying it for me, that COVID obviously has precipitated an acceleration of digitization and other facets of your work. I, I was wondering how you gather uh, your, how do you get your metrics uh, to align with reality, uh, given that you're operating in many areas that are underdeveloped? But in any case, that's a, that's a separate question. We'll come back to you a little bit uh, after we cycle through uh, everyone's 
first round, we'll come back to you and ask you about your uh, further future uh, speculations, okay? Uh, but thank you very much for these remarks. Uh, next, uh, I see we're at Matthias. Welcome. I'm glad you've joined us. Uh, we'll come back to you in due course. We're cycling through uh, the panel now, and we'll come to you in turn for your opening remarks. Right now, it's a pleasure to uh, to introduce Mariana uh, Perko, we've known each other for some years now, Mariana, in various Horace's venues. It's really nice to be seeing you, see you again and working with you again. I know that you have a lot of experience in financial sector. I know that you also have some experience in it, where that segues into politics. You're, you're a consultant with the, who wears ver- many and varied hats. So please give us your introduction. What, what kinds of new and unlikely collaborations or innovations are you looking at in view of the COVID problem? Thank you, Lou. It's a pleasure to be in this panel as well, and thank you for this great uh, introduction. I, um, yeah, I am uh, all my life in in finance. That's true. Uh, now working a, as a consultant, but also I do um, angel investing. So I'm trying to help also the uh, the innovative projects. Many of them are in sustainability area. Uh, I'm in UNICEF, so this is also a humanitarian part. I'm a board member in uh, non-executive board member in UNICEF locally. But uh, um, today I would like to address um, the economical part of sustainability. So, so because this is more my area, um, so economic, uh, economically, how how does sustainability um, affect the economical part? So um, I would like to talk about circular economy. Uh, which is like a alternative to linear economy, which is uh, mostly predominant uh, today in 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 our business sphere, uh, and um, maybe also uh, address one of my experiences in that and what should be done. So, uh, if you look at uh, uh, circular economy, it's not really a def- well defined. Uh, although there are many definitions, uh, uh, there is no clear definition yet. Uh, but it is uh, getting into uh, um, it is getting more and more visibility. European Union Commission has adopted um, um, a strategy uh, uh, regarding circular economy in March this year, uh, and and things are starting to move. Then, of course, this has to be implemented on a, on a um, country level and uh, and on on the company level as well. Um, and if you just uh, comb- like uh, look at what is um, one or another, uh, of course, the circular economy uh, companies, uh, which has either innovative, uh, um, some innovation in the in the field of circularity, or they're even changing the business model so that whatever they use comes back. Uh, uh, so it's being reused. Um, not every time this is possible because of different reasons, either sanitary, for example, Maybe you cannot use the the same plastic for the food because it might be contaminated or whatever, but it could be used somewhere else. And in that area, we we do need collaboration with other companies, which uh, which uh, are then together, not just one by one, but together they are making a circular model, which is not using more uh, resources then uh, then uh, uh, so all the resources are somehow coming back and we are not using more of the natural resources uh, um than than um we used to so i would like to then maybe just uh, quickly say about one of uh, my experiences um last year i was invited to join um one of the investment funds a venture fund which would be investing into circular economy projects uh, we have been pitching uh, that uh, um, around, and um, the major area, major problem that the court was that uh, even the the bank was, which says, well, we support the circular project. Of course, we uh, we have sustainability in our in our agenda, uh, but uh, we are afraid that our circular uh, projects will not be as uh, profitable as the linear because. Because there is no incentive uh, at the moment to 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 promote uh, circularity, so um, in that area a lot has to be done on the on the level of um, of the state, which uh, should somehow penalize the linear projects and uh, and uh, give some tax incentives or whatever incentives to the ones that are circular, because then then it will become uh, level the same uh, level ground. So uh, we did not succeed 
But I just got today a call uh, from 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 the one who was uh, organizing it. Said, "Let we will continue next year. We have some thumbs up that uh, we might get the funding." And I think this this is a good news. But a lot has to be done. In the meantime, we have been trying to promote the circular economy. So we have uh, established a platform. We were talking with uh, with uh, governments, with, uh, with with the companies that are that are trying to 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 move towards the circularity. And um, it's it's a process, but I think uh, if we all um, are aware of it and that we all strive to 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 move forward to that, um, then we will see some progress in time. Okay, thank you very much, Mariana. It sounds more like a political question to me than an economic one, particularly if, if lobbyists are representing the linear economies, it'll be difficult to get politicians on side in some governments for sure. Uh, but when we come back to you on the next round, I'd like to hear more about how COVID has changed the trajectory of your current initiatives, okay? So please bear that in mind. Uh, now I'd like to move on uh, to Christoph von Toggenberg. Our next two speakers have some overlap, I think, uh, although they're coming from uh, different uh, vector points. They uh, they do have some interesting overlap and we'll, we'll see that very shortly. Uh, Christoph is the CEO of World Vision in, in Switzerland and is working with primarily with religious groups around the world. Uh, so Christoph, please tell us uh, a little bit about your work and how that's been changed in, in light of COVID. Yeah, thank you, Lou, for the introduction. And um, um, yeah, for us, I mean, it has been in an interesting sense, um, it has gone up like crazy our work from one moment to another. We are always running at high speed um, and I'm happy to see you, Payal, here because one of our unusual collaborators is MasterCard, uh, just on a side note. Um, and I'll come back to the unusual collaborators later. But just to give you a brief sense, I mean, World Vision is one of the largest children's um, NGOs in the world. We are working in 100 countries. Right now, our COVID response is happening in 70 countries around the world. We have nearly 40,000 staff members. And so far, for example, in the COVID crisis, we've been managing to help 50 million um, highly affected people around the world. So our focus is really around children and their and their communities. Um, me personally, um, I have spent um, almost 20 years of my life working in this field, particularly with children, always very challenging. Um, issues. Are, are you still there? Lou, we lost you for a quick moment. Yes. Still speaking. Yeah, I'm back for the time. Yeah, brilliant. So just as I as I was mentioning, um, so my life has always been around um, very challenging um, children's issues. I mean, particularly things around child abuse, um, child ill treatment, child soldiers. That's why I spend a good amount of my time in war zones um, around the world. And so what we've seen now here, and this is an interesting part, I come out of war zones and suddenly I find myself in Switzerland and many of the dynamics remind me of how you manage a team in a conflict, in fact. Um, and what has happened for us is, I mean, as we've noticed is, of course, um, children in a sense are not the, um, we would say, the directly like health-wise affected people, but indirectly um, extremely heavily affected by what is happening. I mean, as we were just speaking about sort of the economical downturn, what does that mean for children? And I give you just one quick number. I mean, one, we, we came out with a report called the Aftershocks Report, where we looked at how children are going to be affected over the years to come by what's happening and are, of course, already affected. And of course, poverty plays in a, a massive role in this. Um, and I just had a report this morning. I'll give you a small story. Um, there's a girl, she's called Anisha from Nigeria, and she's 16 years old. And she has just been sold off by her aunt to be married to a 40-year-old man. And it's one of those stories, it's a typical child marriage. But why does she get married is because, or why is she get, going to get married is because both of her parents died. She was given to her aunt and her aunt literally can't afford her. So basically that's how her life is going in many ways, going to end at that point. No more education, all of this is going to fall off. So what we see is, is a huge challenge um, in terms of the futures of those kids. 
Um, and at the same time, very impressively, how the organization has put itself together. Um, and we have mobilized, and Lou, I'll come to this later, we mobilized, for example, one of these unusual collaborators, faith communities around the world. And I'm not just talking, I mean, World Vision is a Christian organization, but we work with all um, religions together, all religious leaders, and also we serve people regardless um, of their of their religious um, background. But we see that it has really changed the sector massively. Um, like any other sector, we had to almost reinvent ourselves in many ways. And some of our biggest challenges obviously came from areas that are not digitalized. Yeah, it is easier, obviously, in areas where we are at home. We all have our wireless at home and we can we can do many things over the Internet. In many, many areas where we serve, there is hardly ever even um, a mobile network, not even to speak about um, the Internet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much again for being concise and for this interesting work, Christoph. Uh, obviously, what you didn't say, but it's between the lines of everything you said, is that COVID is ex is exacerbating some of these social uh, problems and gender-based problems which already exist in the world, which have existed for a very long time. And now we see some of the economic effects which tend to make some of these problems worse and not better, particularly for young girls, obviously, being sold off into a marriage for economic reasons. And then, as you mentioned in passing, the child soldier problem, which is, of course, still with us, too. Uh, and I can only imagine that COVID is not helping either of those problems to ameliorate. So thank you for that work. And uh, I don't know if, Matthias, are you still with us? I don't see you at the moment, but are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Splendid. All right. Well, I'd like to introduce last but not least, uh, last but not least, Dr. Matthias Bosch, who's the founder of Bosch Yale in Germany. And I know, Matthias, from our prior discussion that you have a vested interest in social and emotional learning. So the children that Christoph is rescuing perhaps could then be handed off to you uh, for this very important dimension of their of their socialization. Please tell us about your work and how it's being impacted by COVID. Yes, well, thank you very much, Joe. I hope everybody can see me now. And sorry for the late coming. I was had to log on and log off again. It was a little bit of a glitch here. Um, very interesting what you said, Christoph, about your work uh, about children. We are at Global Dignity. Um, we are actually uh, addressing uh, the term dignity in, in now 85 countries and addressing 1 million kids a year because we think the term dignity and a dignified life is the basis for all of that. But how do I come to that? I'm actually a patent attorney, um, so technology is for me a, a big element of my life, teaching and learning technology. And I realized that, that even so technology is so important right now, um, and, and math and physics and all of that is the focus of the education here, because this is where the demand is. People want to do go into that field, but there is a huge lack now of social and emotional learning, because this is the element where people learn empathy, they learn compassion, critical thinking, they learn how to get involved with other people. And now during COVID, we had to learn so, uh, you know, all down to a, on an everyday basis, we are isolated and the interhuman connection is so much more important. And if that is not there, we are not able to kind of really go into these other fields. So our point is, um, the, 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 all the engineering, all these elements are important to technology, but the social emotional elements has been drastically neglected. And one drastic example is Brazil. You know, Bolsonaro, even though he cut the entire budget and threw out all those philosophy, all the thinking, only going towards uh, money making elements like yeah, software engineering, physics, and all of that. So it's completely undervalued. But we cannot build a society, especially now, which is so important, where we are teaching and start teaching our kids to learn being empathic, learn compassion, learning how to think critical and go forward. So this is the connection we have here. So what we do, we go into schools. Sadly, we are not able to go so much because everything is digital. So we are also morphing into more of the digital world to, to reach now kids. Here in Germany, we are able now to go into schools. But we have um, a, a huge community in Pakistan, a big one in the Philippines, and as I said, reaching 1.1 million a year. But um, hopefully that's just the start. And I run the German part here, and um, 
And I'm proud to be here. Thank you, Lou, for the invitation. Thank you very much for that, uh, Matthias. Much appreciated. Uh, we we can't. I don't see you at the moment, but we certainly we certainly hear you. And I, I, as a humanities professor, a philosopher, I I also hear, of course, your your important observation that while STEM is necessary, uh, and and STEM education is more and more important for everybody, it's not sufficient to to form a well-rounded human being and so the work you're doing is is extremely important on that neglected uh right side of the brain and, and i hope that uh, humanities uh, is in the mix as well as social and emotional learning so in any case we've been through one round um I, and we only have now 18 minutes or so in the session, as always happens. We are compressed uh, on this platform. I, I see that there are a number of participants, uh, and if any of them, I mean, this might be a nice time to invite a question, perhaps one or two questions, and then we can go back to the panel for their closing remarks uh, and their takeaways. So I would like to know if anyone in the, uh, in the audience, as it were, has a question, please type it into the chat room. Uh, and uh, and then we can share it with the. I'll be happy to share it with the panel and ask them to speak to it. Um, Helena is thanking uh, Payal, um, and a lot of people are working on uh, on sustainability. Um, are, are there any? Uh, and Louise also. Uh, Louise Neal adds that there's the biggest challenge to educate children uh, empathically is 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 how to do this in a digital environment. Indeed, it's much more easy to experience empathy if we're in person. Uh, and virtual education seems to work better for more mature people who can sort of process the virtuality. Children are having more problems in virtual classrooms, especially school age children. It's much more difficult for them to be detached. Uh, so that's a, that's a challenge that virtuality still has to manage. Are there any specific questions uh, that you would like? Uh, I'm now as asking the audience, are there any specific questions that you would like the panel to address in our remaining time? Uh, here's a question uh, from Ananda. Um, what uh, what do you think the unlikely collaboration needs to be pursued uh, in surviving and thriving from the pandemic situation we have now uh, in the absence of global leadership? Well, that question needs to be parsed. I, I mean, this is a, a very interesting question, Ananda. I will turn it over to the panel immediately. Uh, what kind of uh, unlikely collaboration do we need to pursue in, in the absence of global leadership? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean, and maybe each panelist will say what they think it means. But th th ever since this thing broke upon us, national governments have had to circle the wagons and, and look after their own citizens. It has disrupted uh, globalization, however you construe it. Uh, so citizens are looking each to their governments for 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 uh, s some kind of direction. Uh, and so uh, how do we resuscitate global leadership or did we ever have it? OK, that's a question. Let's go to each panelist and we'll start with Pal. Would you like to address this briefly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just say in terms of unlikely collaborators and Lou mentioned um, kind of my hypothesis, which is that I think the private sector needs to be better at partnering with the private sector. So thinking about the frame of private private partnerships and it's not just transactional and it's not just financial. It's also about how do you leverage the full cohort of your assets? So your human capital, your data, your technology, your networks. Um, and so what we're trying to do in the small business realm is do just that. So, yes, I have philanthropic money, but I also have some fantastic data scientists. I have some amazing uh, techno payments technology. So how do I leverage all of that to really catalyze social impact? And so that would be my call to action in terms of unlikely collaborators is companies need to work with each other better. Thank you very much for that. And, and I'll ask each speaker to be concise as you are you're really tremendously well spoken and concise by you're setting a good example in the remaining time let's go to florian please florian what do you see and this also segues into our closing question about you know immediate and and for further future trajectories so how do you see this shaping up in your sector florian again uh, the question is a very relevant one um and again as in the absence of let's say governments being busy with themselves, their voters, um, and of course their own bailouts, we see amazing things happening. Number one is, I mean, the technology, technology is a key, key driver. As technology is enabling the individual households to participate in the real economy, which they couldn't before, 
you know, and you basically have connected rural homes and where fintech, clean tech, ed tech, agri tech, you know, all of those are pieces to it at models which are scalable and the adoption is much faster. So from a pure sector perspective, I see um, an interesting part. Now, what, what we're really excited about is we have now collaborations with UN agencies. We have collaboration with uh, global NGOs. We have co- collaborations with industry alliances like Smart Smart Africa, for example, is one, you know, focused on digitalization. So it is a, basically a push of uh, multilaterals, not governments necessarily. It's a push of um, from the private sector from a philanthropic side wanting to double down into the impact investing piece. So it's not just a one-off, but it actually creates structure. And it's in the value chain of, you know, helping companies over the, over the time to double down. And of course, it's technology. And technology has the, the, the big benefit that you see actually now crowdfunding. You see different ways of even on the, on the tokenizations coming into a way where people can participate in funding, in supporting in a sustainable way. And also where you see the big asset managers being pushed into sustainability, at least more and more ESG, and some of them really going the path of impact investing. Now, it's a fine line. You know, we have to be careful whether it shouldn't be impact washing or green washing. It should be really. So the data component is also it has to be granular enough to really measure what my dollar or my euro I'm investing in really does on the ground. But we see that happening, which is not no not no longer just the government approach of a country, but also we have African countries, for example, now seeding catalytic capital funds, Ivory Coast just did, for their own sake of technology being implemented in not just their own country, but in the region, because technology companies don't stop. So it's not, but it's not just pure tech, there's also the tech enabled component. So we see an amazing acceleration besides all of the, let's say, the news around uh, the governments being busy with themselves, um, really happening on the ground. So it's an exciting moment. Very, as I said, very unusual players. Yeah. Even for us, we just partnered and announced it as a asset manager. We are, you know, we uh, did an alliance with Palladium Group. Palladium Group being a major developer on the ground, they are also looking from the pure development side, how to really double down on sustainable way in impact investing. So it's, uh, it's an amazing opportunity for our sector. Okay, thank you very much for that. I, I gather you're all busier than ever. Basically, COVID is 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 both necessitating and also facilitating uh, some of these novel partnerships. And hopefully, you're all very optimistic too. Uh, let's continue. Uh, so, uh, Mirjana, how how do you see this? Uh, what specific uh, novelties do you see on your horizon? Um, and and what do you see as a, as our way through and out of this pandemic as a result? Yeah. I think uh, COVID has uh, um, uh, made many companies thriving, but much more companies struggling to to stay alive. So uh, punishing them with uh, additional tax uh, because they are not in a in a in a some sustainable business model, it's uh, it's a it's a challenge. Uh, there are many innovative projects uh, which we have seen, uh, exp- especially in in the area of sustainability. So uh, I think um, we have to somehow attract more private capital that would be um, willing to invest into those projects, so that so the sustainability does not uh, uh, stay pushed aside now because of the crisis that the corona has uh, has caused. So um, I think we will have to mo- work more on. Understanding that uh, that we cannot uh, stay as we are, even though there is crisis. And I've talked uh, with some um, gen- uh, generation Z, um, uh, young people. They they do uh, very much want uh, uh, world to become clearer, better, uh, um, and to be more sustainable. So uh, and they will punish those companies that will use the linear model. And so. Let's hope that it will come from both sides. So investments from one side and also push from the buyer side uh, to to punish those that are um, that are not working towards sustainability. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mariana. And I'd like now to go back to Christoph. And Christoph, really the same question to you uh, in terms of world vision. What do you see as a novel partnerships in the immediate and, and further future? And what trajectory does that take to uh, get us out of the pandemic? So very briefly, one mention I wanted just to say about leadership. 
whenever leadership is lacking, someone will fill the gap. So we always have to make sure, um, and we see this all over the places where we work, we empower youth and they have become really leaders in this pandemic and have played a very important role. And just to mention one of our unlikely collaborators is all um, is faith leaders, because many of the areas that we're working in, and we have learned a lot from the Zika and the Ebola crisis, is you um, often, the people that we are helping, they can't even read or write. Yeah. So, um, and again, as I said before, and they might not even be in areas where they can be technologically reached, but they listen to their faith leaders. And that's very helpful. And now, for example, we have just brought on board another 80,000 faith leaders globally, helping to spread the right messaging in terms of for people to protect themselves. So this has been um, hugely um, successful, but it also, it helps us to have a lot of trust in the communities because of course you need to find the right channels. Um, and we call them the channels of hope, in fact, the channels to enter um, those areas. And interesting enough, despite of the fact that we are a Christian organization, we are, for example, heavily involved and working heavily in countries like Afghanistan and areas where you would not expect to find an organization like us. But because we do not, I mean, again, we work with everybody together. And um, for us, the important thing is that people get objective and helpful, um, helpful messaging. But this is just one example of unlikely collaborators. And another one, as I mentioned before, is the youth. We had, for example, recently cases in Cox Bazar, which is one of the largest refugee camps. It's based in, in Bangladesh. And we had huge problems because m most of the refugees speak different languages. So we couldn't spread the messages um, uh, in sort of in a written form. And so what did the youth, for example, do? They started to perform theaters and dances for people to understand what are um, the, the right health measures to take um, in order to protect themselves in an environment like a refugee camp. And it looks quite hilarious. I mean, you see they're drawing um, sort of squares on the ground where people have to stand in social distancing and then they're performing their shows for people um, to understand. But then of course, if we take it up a level up, I mean, of course, our partnership, for example, with MasterCard is hugely important when it comes to financial transactions in these in these areas, because, of course, people have lost and, and mostly, I mean, in the countries where we're working, most people work in the informal sector. So their livelihood stage, they have no security base. So that drops from the moment they can't get employment. That's basically when there is absolutely nothing coming in anymore. And so that's where it's very important to help those families that are most affected. As I brought the example before from child marriages, that's just one of the few consequences. I mean, what we've also recorded is that in most of the areas we're running, in many, um, in many areas we're running um, uh, children's helplines, we have recorded an increase in some areas of up to 100% more children calling in distress because of domestic violence and other issues. So great opportunity for us. I really see a lot of way forward in terms of also our digitalization. We have beefed that up massively in the last few months, but I couldn't agree more with all the panelists. I think it's more collaboration, more collaboration and more collaboration. I think we can learn so much from each other. And I think the more we partner up, the more we can reach. Thank you. Or to Matthias now. Thank you, Christoph. We have to move on because uh, our time to collaborate is shrinking this morning. Uh, I would just say to you that uh, it's not only uh, unlikely that all the different religions of the world collaborate more, more intimately, it's also necessary. So thank you for the work you're doing in that sector. I would like to now invite Matthias to make, we have three minutes. Can you please... Yes. In two minutes, give us a give us yeah. your, your your closing remarks sure. about the trajectory and your unlikely uh, part. Yeah, so our partnerships are actually with industries and with companies who like to kind of do something in the SDG field. That is for us a welcoming entree to give them a chance to uh, support children, and we use the money we will get here from uh, all the industry leaders to bring it into various other countries. But let me just give you one other aspect about leadership. I think one important element, because not all countries have a lack of leadership. And, and I have to say that just yesterday, Angela Merkel was 
clearly emphasizing that we need more compassion and empathy to stand together that we are able to do that. And this is not a political statement. This is a statement for the society. So solidarity and leadership must come from our government. And if we trust our government, what we do here in, in Germany, we believe that what they do on, based on the scientific elements and the scientific findings is the right way. Even so, we all hate wearing masks, of course, nobody likes that, but it's the only way to kind of make this uh, pandemic you know, worthwhile for us to kind of go through this. And so this is, um, so the, the, this was the question about lacking leadership. Leadership is not always lacking, but it, it must come in a, in a way that people understand it and not in a political way. You can't win this pandemic on a political level. You can only win it on a scientific and with the society. So you need to have a solidarity and they, they need to also wear the mask and do all that. And I think if this comes from a leader, I think then, then you get the credibility you're looking for. Thank you very much. I, of course, couldn't agree more, except that in an election year in the U.S., it's very difficult for not for everything to get politicized. This is the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. Uh, but I do hope that the science will prevail, although science uh, is, is asking more questions than it's answering still. It's going to take us quite a while, I'm sure you'll agree, to reconcile these vastly different arrays of numbers that we get depending on which metric we analyze. So it's going to take a whole team of leaders uh, in order to be able to make sense of that eventually and, and, and not to allow it to be politicized. Look, we have a minute and 29 seconds. I, I think it's just I want to thank our panelists for being so optimistic, for being so collaborative and for contributing such a vast variety of expertise to this very important question about unlikely collaboration and innovation during the pandemic and then hopefully on the other side of it. Um, I'm tempted to ask you each for 10 seconds can you give us one sentence as a takeaway? I'm going to challenge you now. We have a minute left. So I'm going first to pay out one sentence, please. Ten seconds. Uh, let's move partnerships from transactional to transformative. Transactional to transformative. Wonderful. Okay, Florian, one sentence, please. Let's align interest of old silos into a joint um, theme to hit, uh, to, to impact the uh, Great. Uh, Mariana, one quick sentence. I think it's time for everybody to be more human to each other. So don't forget about humanity in these times. Wonderful. Christophe, one sentence, please. Never give up. Let's be bold and be kind. Great. That's what. Let's make humanity great again. Huh? Okay. And Matthias, last but not least, one sentence, please. Well, this all sums up into kind of shifting dignity into the focus of our society again. We could all use more dignity. It's uh, renewable and uh, it's not expensive. Okay. Thank you very much for your great contributions this morning and, and best, uh, and best uh, wishes for your continued success in this important venture that we're all caught up in. Okay. Thanks again. And thanks again to our audience. I'm sorry we didn't have more time to interact with you. This is uh, the way we are on the platform. I, if I may take moderator's license, I want to say special hello to my cousin Sonia, who's in the <laughs> audience. And she's also uh, the ambassador for Harassa. So I guess I'm allowed to acknowledge her. Hi, Sonia. And thanks for being here with us today. So uh, thank you so much. What a great panel. I just wish we had more time. Uh, I hope to see you and continue to, to meet with some of you again. Okay. All the best to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Take Thank care, everyone. Okay, great. Good day to you. Thank you so much.